Yes. So oh. okay. So yeah. thank you. Uh, <laughs> so th so <laughs> again, thanks, Houston Mission Control in Girona specifically. Um, I know. I mean, we all have recycled from project managers or scientists to TV presenters these days. I think we are doing quite well. We still have um, around 200 people, 200 people connected. Again, thank you to uh, the team in Girona taking care that everything goes well. Uh, Nuria, uh, Marta, and Toti, and the rest of the team. So again, I mean, I hope you see the voting of the the voting uh, of the first vaccine which is going to be approved by the European Medicines Agency. I've seen that the Chinese Moderna teams are improving, but still is Oxford <laughs> winning the day. So I can, I, yeah. I mean, don't you like adenoviruses? I mean, there are a lot of beautiful adenoviruses there. Adeno 5, CanSino, Adeno 26, Janssen, Oxford is a chimpanzee adenovirus, but Human adenovirus, human adenoviruses are beautiful, and RNA is beautiful too. So, and the classical inactivated virus inactivated vaccine from Sinovac, Sinopharm, it's also worth considering. Or the subunit vaccine of Novavax, it's also worth considering. So, just saying, not everything is Oxford, right? Okay, so uh, fifteen down, five to go. Thank you for your patience. We are still 200 people connected. So we have seen we have seen 15 projects, excellent science. We have seen we have seen vaccines, we have seen therapies, we have we have seen monoclonal antibodies, we have seen reprofiling, a very relevant area. Now it's time for uh, medical devices, med tech, diagnost diagnostics, and population study. So the last five projects of tonight, I was saying afternoon, now it's going more in the entering into the evening. So the five last the five last projects are in the area of medical devices, diagnostics and uh, population studies. And the chair of this session is uh, Christina Vescos, the director, the managing director of EIT Health. Christina, Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Jordi, for inviting me to chair this, this last session. I, um, as you mentioned, from EIT Health, we are probably the last in the chain of uh, bringing the, the science to the market uh, because we are dealing with the innovation part and, and probably that's the reason we are in the, in the last panel. I can find also other two reasons. One is, is related to the, the mixed panel that we have. Uh, and I think it's one of our, our motors that uh, in order to really bring science to, to the citizens, you need to have really um, a mix of disciplines and, and, and all the stakeholders involved in the, in the value chain. So today in this session, we have um, two presentations related to diagnostic devices and then three related more to genetic population studies. And probably the third reason I find to be here is, is bringing a bit of the European um, approach and I will be a bit Germanic in, in, in the time keeping as we are running a bit late, I understand. So mm -hmm. uh, just for all of you that are in the audience, please be patient. Keep us um, with with us for the last um, the next half an hour of, of this um, interesting session. So, without delay, I would like to um, present our five panelists. So, first we'll get um, uh, Jordi Alonso from uh, the Research Institute uh, of Hospital del Mar. We'll present a study on on the impact of uh, mental health um, of COVID. Um, second will be Giulio Rosati from the Catalan Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology, um, who will talk about printing your own COVID-19 sensor uh, as point of care device. Uh, afterwards, Nana Rul uh, from um, Pere Virgili will, will present um, the 
also a, a biomarker um, identification for, for early diagnosis of COVID-19. On, on the fourth um, uh, row, uh, Marta Soler also from ICN2 will, will introduce um, um, advanced bios, uh, nano biosensors for global um, point of care diagnostic and, and surveillance. And last but not least, Concepcion Violan from IGTP will introduce a population study on uh, the identification of carrier status and, and COVID-19 immune response related to progression phenotype. So uh, without any more delay, I will give the word then to Jordi Alonso, Hospital del Mar, who will talk about um, mental impact, uh, mental health impact and needs associated with uh, COVID-19, a project called Mind COVID. Uh, Jordi, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Christina. I hope you can hear me well. Um, so it's my pleasure to uh, be presenting this work on uh, um, behalf of my colleagues of my own uh, research institute at INIM, uh, at the Hospital Le Mar, but also uh, the, as a part of a collaboration with uh, many other institutions in Spain. Um, as you know, uh, adverse mental health uh, is associated or has been uh, um, pronounced, uh, said that it will be the fourth wave uh, of the uh, COVID-19 or even uh, it's called a, a parallel pandemic. So, uh, but no, can I have, uh, ba go back to the first one first, thank you. Um, so there is need to, to, to measure uh, the real magnitude to monitor and to uh, know the evolution of the mental health impact uh, in order to accurately inform health authorities and to deploy adequate treatments so we need rigorous methods and analysis. In, uh, this is what um, chronic disease epidemiologists like myself do. And um, I'm happy to present uh, uh, this study that is funded uh, by the uh, Health Institute Carlos III. Please, can I have this uh, next slide? So uh, to the best of our knowledge, this is uh, uh, one of the largest uh, studies in mental health in Spain. It includes uh, 24 groups uh, uh, in different health institutions, and it covers, uh, say, six uh, uh, autonomous communities. It is based on a series of pro prospective cohort studies with the aim of uh, assessing which is the impact of, uh, uh, of the disease on mental health. It's also uh, trying to identify risks of the various types that are uh, uh, risk factors and also protective factors that are associated with the onset of mental disorders, but also those that are uh, associated with the persistence of adverse mental health conditions a long time. And uh, it's uh, uh, important that we need uh, to uh, quantify the use of mental health resources that we know are very low in general, and, and we anticipate they are gonna be lower during the pandemic and, and identify and met uh, uh, mental uh, uh, um, health needs for care. Uh, these uh, these in, uh, project w by ma mandate uh, it has to feedback uh, with recommendations to the mental health authorities and the professionals uh, planning and deploying uh, services. Can I have the next one, please? So we are studying three types of uh, different populations uh, with the same methods and assessment tools. Uh, Ten thousand healthcare workers in Spain. Two thousand. Uh, either COVID uh, uh, patients or close contacts, mostly COVID patients, and then a random sample of 3,500 individuals that are representative of the adult general population. We're using web-based survey uh, platforms for that, um, and we are uh, measuring a baseline three and six month follow-up. And obviously we have plans to, uh, not funds, but plans to continue in the future. Um, for those people that are not competent with online technologies, we are uh, um, using telephone interviews. So um, I mentioned that there was a number of, of, of factors that we are interested in, and these include individual and personal and social, uh, socioeconomic uh, information. It also includes um, mm, mm, COVID infection exposure status, and personal and family and, and, and professional. And obviously the, the center of the study is mental health, uh, mental health uh, disorders, 
post-traumatic stress, panic, depression, anxiety, alcohol use, suicide, and services use, and psychological functioning and health and quality of life. Uh, we have already analyzed the data for the for the healthcare uh, workers baseline, and unfortunately, these data are now embargoed because they are at the end of the peer review process. But what I can uh, tell you is that um, the prevalences of a specific mental disorder is high, including suicidality. Can I have the next one, please, and the last one? Um, we are convinced that our pr uh, project uh, has the capacity and should contribute to improvement of knowledge. And it should have also uh, eventually an impact on the identification of, and meeting of the healthcare needs uh, for mental care. Uh, first, I think uh, we are applying uh, rigorous uh, methods in uh, trying to use acknowledgeable, uh, actionable knowledge or uh, actionable information. Uh, second, we think that uh, we're relatively uh, rapid uh, as assessing the health needs of the population. I mean, more rapidly than it has been done in the past, for sure. I think this is something that every one of us is experiencing this moment. And we are also interested not in the immediate impact, which is important uh, as we already know, but in the maintain uh, in the future and the longer term, because um, previous studies in previous uh, associated... Uh, the, I'm finishing right now. Please be uh, ending, thank you. And, and so, so uh, the, other, the other important issue is that we, we are thinking of uh, a very important uh, concept, which is uh, vulnerable populations. Um, and I think that the finally is uh, we are going to provide a platform that consists not only in the technology, but in the methods and the instruments to uh, uh, evaluate e-health and other interventions that we'll be using, we'll be using this, uh, during this pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jordi, for this uh, introduction of uh, this study. Then we, we give the floor to Julio Rosati from ICN2 with uh, his paper on rapid diagnosis of COVID-19 and other viral upper respiratory tract infections through a rapid paper-based device. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, I would like to thank BioCAD for uh, the opportunity of being here and for the very nice format of this uh, virtual seminar that, that I find particularly helpful for our research. So good afternoon to you all. and. I'm Giulio Rosati, a researcher in the Nanobioelectronics and Biosensors Group, led by iCREA professor Arben Mercosi at ICN2. And today I will introduce you to a new paradigm to spread COVID-19 biosensing and to make it effective, fast and possible at the point of care, thanks also to a CSIC project received by our group. You already know why we are here. At the beginning of this year, we experienced what many researchers have advised that would have happened for years. A pandemic originated in China and rapidly exported in our countries, thanks to our interconnected and globalized society. Uh, next, please. The infection detection is paramount to contain a pandemic, as you know. However, so far, we have been able to introduce just two methods, each one with relevant drawbacks, unfortunately. PCR is a standard method for the virus detection in azipharyngeal samples. However, it's pretty expensive. It takes 24 to 48 hours to give a result, and it requires qualified personnel in laboratories. On the other side, serological rapid tests take 15 minutes, so they are pretty fast. At the point of care, with blood samples, but only check for the subject's response to the virus, eventually developed several days after infection, or in many cases, they cannot distinguish the infection from a normal cold. So now let me present you the device we are developing to face these issues for a rapid and point of care solution to the detection. But this is not only another sensor on the shelf. What we really propose is not the sensor, but the platform with a print your sensor capability. So in fact, our sensors are fabricated by inchet printing with low cost equipment, an office printer, and automated procedures, which could be performed by unskilled personnel. Our goal is to distribute the production capability instead of selling the sensors, making every country 
overall those with low resources, autonomous in their fabrication and making the sensors available very fast for those who need. In particular, our platform has a fixed cost lying under 1,000 euros, is pretty cheap, and the variable costs are under 0 0.5 cents per sensor. The platform allows now fabricating up to five sensors per minute for small volumes, but much higher rate is possible with high volume production. Our sensors are read by a smartphone with a commercial app, and they are easily functionalized for SARS-CoV-2 spike protein detection, so for the whole virus detection, in less than 10 minutes. And uh, regarding the applications, uh, next slide, please. The application in the clinics are, uh, I think, pretty obvious with decentralized mass production and massive testing, but also with important consequences for the production in developing countries for these and for future pandemics. While less obvious but uh, equally important applications are related to the monitoring of the territory, for example, with sewage water monitoring for target and precision containment actions, for which we are writing a project proposal for the Agaur Pandemic 2020 call here in, uh, in Catalonia. And, uh, and this, is a, a very important, this is a very important application because it covers the gap that we that sometimes we are seeing between um, science and, uh, and uh, politics, economy. So, well, from my side, that's all. And uh, for further information or any question, feel free to contact us by email. And of course, thanks for your kind attention. Thank you, Julio, perfect timing. So you even uh, finish earlier than, than planned, so um, very interesting presentation. Let's then Thank move to, to Anna Rule from Pere Bilrili, who will present her paper, Circulating and Cellular Prognostic Biomarkers for COVID-19 Progression in Patients with SARS-CoV-2 Infection Using Multiomic Science. Anna, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, and um, thank you for give us the opportunity in the next five minutes to tell about our project Covidomics. So as you could see in the next slide, please, Covidomics aim to improve the knowledge regarding the immunopathology of COVID disease and to predict, uh, to search for predictive markers of COVID severity. And to accomplish this objective, we are creating a COVID patient's cohort and we are classifying the patients based on their clinical evolution. Um, we believe that our results will help us to identify potential therapeutic targets for this global pandemic. So in the next slide, you can see that both post COVID positive uh, patients and COVID positive medical staff from our hospital that consent to participate in the study are included at the moment of diagnosis and we are follow up them after four, eight weeks of infection. Then we are classifying these uh, patients in four groups depending on their evolution as asymptomatic, low grade, moderate, and severe. And also we are recording information about uh, previous comorbidities such as obesity and diabetes to determine their association to COVID severity and clinical prog prognosis. From March to June, we recruited uh, more than 170 patients and because it's an open core of a study, uh, now we are around uh, 300 of patients. At this moment, uh, we are performing a multiomic approach. And for this task, we contact to Maria Jose Buzon and Melchel Genesca from uh, Valdebron Institute de Recerca, and also with Ezequiel Ruiz Mateos and Alicia Gutierrez from Ibis Sevilla. And uh, both uh, groups sent us uh, some of their samples to include in our omics analysis. We perform analysis of 400 samples, including both baseline and follow-up time points. Our objectives are to understand what makes the different clinical progression happen with the study of proteome, and also to answer the questions, what has happened or uh, what is happening with the study of the metabolome, which includes the changes of metabolites and also lipids. We have a start with interpretation of proteomics data, and in the next weeks, we are uh, we think that we will be able to start the interpretation of metabolomics and uh, also lipidomics. 
at the same time, we start a collaboration with the um, Cancer uh, Epigenetics Group uh, from Institute de Recerca contra la Leucemia, de Josep Carreras. They contact us as a result of a quick of, uh, COVID network meeting, and they will help us to answer the other question, what can happen with the genomics and epigenomics study? We send them around 130 genomic DNA samples, and we are now wait, waiting for the results. Um, the integrative analysis of all these data sets obtained from the uh, multi-amic approaches will be completed with the measurement of specific circulating uh, inflammatory markers. This task will be done by two different groups of our institution. Um, the AMED group will determine uh, succinate and succinate related molecules uh, as an excellent predictive biomarkers of inflama inflammation status. And the other group uh, will perform a multi, uh, an multiplex analysis and is especially interested in the study of the association between obesity and COVID severity. And for the next month, we will also try to isolate different cellular subtypes that we know that are crucial in the immune response. So uh, in this last slide, uh, we show you uh, the research impact that we hope to obtain with this project, that uh, we are uh, starting uh, analyzing the data. Because we are creating a well-defined patient core with detailed clinical data, integrative multiomic signatures, circulating concentrations of different uh, inflammatory markers, we anticipate the identification of uh, pre predictive biomarkers of COVID severity, but also the identification of unexpected and or no, unknown key molecules in the immunopathogenesis of COVID disease. Thus, uh, we believe that the obtained results will be addressed to attend the necessities of the last end users, that are the patients, but also the health system, allowing the physicians for a rapid diagnosis of their patients, anticipating to the disease evolution. So uh, this is uh, the information that uh, I tell you about our project, but uh, please, if you are, have more interest, you could contact with us. And it's, for, and it's okay. And the, all, all. Thank you for the attendance. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. We, we have passed then the middle of our session, and I think you could all agree that we are seeing very good examples of, of beautiful science and, and game changers. So please note that for, for the voting that will uh, start at the, at, again at the end of the session. And let's move then to the, to the next speaker, who is uh, Maria Soler from ICN2, who will talk about the COMBAT project. It's also um, a biosensor for diagnostic and surveillance. Thank you, Maria. Hi, hello. So I will talk about this COMBAT project, probably most of you have heard about. It's a European project that started in early March, just when the pandemic reached Europe. And the project is a collaboration with the University of Barcelona, the University of Faith Marseille in France, and also the Institute for uh, Infectious Diseases in Italy. But also during this time, we have fostered some local collaborations with the Valle Bron and the Clinic Hospital here in Barcelona, with the University of Valencia and the CMB in Madrid. So all in uh, order to accelerate the validation of the, our technology for the diagnostics. So if you can play the video, what uh, we are trying to do in short is to adapt one of our pioneering nanotechnology for biosensors that uh, will be able to diagnose uh, the COVID infection fast and in a reliable way. And it will be, of course, applied for patients, for human patients, but it's our idea also to adapt it for the monitoring of coronaviruses in bats, for example, to uh, control the evolution of these viruses and prevent for future outbreaks. So the next slide, please. So our nanophotonic biosensors uh, exploit the light properties of the nanoscale. So we are able to perform label-free and real-time analysis of any um, biomolecule in general, also viruses and bacteria. We fabricate the sensors here in Barcelona at large scale, so they are cheap. And uh, we can uh, use them as a disposable cartridges to in portable devices that can be operated at the point of care. So, for example, in uh, primary care centers or pharmacies. 
And also thanks to our collaborators, we have access to high quality material like SARS-CoV-2 samples inactivated, uh, specific antibodies and viral antigens, and also uh, human clinical samples and uh, animal samples for the, for the validation. So next, please. So the main advantage of our technology is that it's very versatile and is uh, uh, super sensitive. So what we want to do is uh, develop uh, one platform to, the, to perform three types of assays. One is the direct virus assay. So we are able to detect the intact viruses in uh, saliva samples in just 15, 20 minute samples. And also we are able to provide the viral load in the patient. So it's a kind of prognosis, not only diagnosis, yes or no, but prognosis to closely monitor the patient for possible complications. We also have an additional confirmatory test based on genomic analysis. So we are able to identify the viral RNA without the need of PCR, the amplification. So the total assay time will be around 30 minutes. And we can also multiplex. So we could distinguish between COVID, uh, flu, common cold, or different type of, uh, of uh, viruses. And plus, besides the combat project itself, we are also developing the serological assay with our biosensors because we can uh, achieve very sensitive detection of antibodies and also to quantify them. So in, rather than a yes, no to the presence of antibodies, we can quantify them. So we believe this is very useful for vaccine evaluation and development and to assess the immunity response. In, in patients. So next slide, please. So I would like to show our first results. For example, for the direct virus detection, we are already with very good sensitivities. We are detecting uh, less than 100 viral particles per milliliter, taking into account that the minimum levels found in patients through PCR are between uh, 10 to 3 to 10 to 5, usually around 10 to 7. We are well below the levels in patients. We are now uh, testing the, the detection in saliva samples, and we expect to, to validate the sensor in the following month. And the next, please. So for the serological assay, is the one we have more, more advanced. We are already in clinical validation of the sensor. In this uh, preliminary study that I show here, it's uh, made with uh, control and patient samples. We were perfectly able to discriminate between negative and positive COVID patients and also to, to relate the amount of antibodies to the severity of the infection in the patients. So next, please. So uh, in conclusion, I would like to say that uh, we believe that we are on the way to provide a portable and rapid device for COVID-19 screening. We we offer quantitative detection at the point of care with easy and non-invasive sample optation. Uh, we, our approach is a multi-target and global diagnostics that uh, can be used for any type of viruses. And yeah, we want to prevent uh, disease uh, spread among uh, human patients, but we are one also to prevent future outbreaks by monitoring the, the coronavirus evolution in, in reservoir animals. And that's it. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. So we've seen already in the three projects related to, to diagnostics, so rapid, portable, cheap, uh, accurate, and even do it printed yourself uh, devices, definitely that can be game changers in, in this fight um, against COVID. The last presentation goes to uh, Concepcion Violan from uh, German Triasi Puyol, and, and she will present a population study um, related to the identification of carrier status of SARS-CoV-2 uh, immune response related to progression phenotype. So, Concepcion, go ahead. Concepcion, I think you are on mute. You need to unmute yourself. Okay, sorry. I will start again. <laughs> and then, uh, good afternoon. First of all, 
I will give two thanks to the institutions to organize in this event and allow us to present the population study, identification of carrier status and SARS-CoV-2 immune responses related to the progression phenotype. The name and acronymus is ANFAHOP-PROCRETIC-19. Uh, this study is led by the researchers from IGTP, Idiab Jordi Gol and Irsi Kasha. The names of the researchers is uh, Dr. Pere Toran, Julia García Prado and Eva Martínez Cáceres. And also this project are involved the primary health centers and the German Trias y Pujol Hospital of Metropolitana North Area of Barcelona. This study is funded by the Department of Health of Generalitat de Catalunya with the collaboration uh, with BioCAP. Next, please. One of the key questions is the people who have been infected with SARS-CoV-2, whether symptomatic or asymptomatic, develop permanent immunity to the virus? The answer to this question is crucial for epidemiologists, policymakers, professionals in the, and the health services and the society in large. In essence, the, this project uh, prioritized now is the how best control and predict the courses of pandemic. By performing the long-term immunological studies of the population, we will be able to uh, three points. The first is characterize the kinetics of SARS-CoV-2 antibodies with the LISA or another flu reagents for the detection antibodies against SARS-CoV-2. Also, identify the individuals with a strong immune response for, against for SARS-CoV-2 and determining the duration of the humoral and cellular responses to the virus. And third, determine the role of innate and adaptive immunity, plasma and blood with the TB lymphocytes and cytokines against the SARS-CoV-2. The aim of this study is to analyze the differential characteristics of the immune response against SARS-CoV-2 associated with the disease outcome in asymptomatic versus asymptomatic carriers in long-term polls. Uh, next, please. Uh, first one, uh, how do we develop this project? We design a prospective core with four cores of health workers and one core of general population. The first course of general, of general uh, of health workers was one for prevalent professionals. That means the professionals is infected in the first wave. The second is the professionals is infected in the second wave, we mean the sick uh, professionals. And the symptomatic incident general population is the third course of health professionals and exposed population with a high or low risk scores. The, uh, the five core is the individuals of general population is infected in the second wave. The variables of this study was the diagnosis and comorbidity that people has, sex, hospital admissions, and COVID symptoms. We, uh, we decided to do the IRT-PCR performance at the, in period, at the inclusion period of the study and 14 days after inclusion. Also, we measure the antibodies analyzed of the inclusion period and in different periods of time of the first uh, IRT-CPR test. And also, we determine the T cells and cytokines analyzed in different periods of time after the PPC test. The study is follow up during one year. And the next, please. The study, as we as before, is developed in the metropolitan North area and included a 600 population, and the sample of the study is a 600 health professionals and 150 general population. Next one, please. Why, why it is the, the impact of this project? First, the scientific and innovation and social. We do the current assessment of the antibody response during the pandemic in the first and the second wave. And we have an important epidemiological data on exposure of SARS-CoV-2 and herd immunity. Also, we obtained in a kinetics of the SARS-CoV-2 immunity, humoral and cellular, and do important epidemiological data on exposures of SARS-CoV-2 and herd immunity with the big numbers. 
we do the acceleration of knowledge because Prohibit Core 19 is a basis for more than six COVID projects, basic to translational. And, and the doctors Julia Prado said, and a strong collaboration with the high resolution of COV2 specific T cells immunity to drive broad coronavirus vaccine development project will allow to identify the cellular immunity between the different cores and complement the information of development of vaccine. This is the paradigm shift because wars are turned into reality. The translational research between clinical basic science and population research. And finally, I would like to thank to the health professionals that are involved in this project who are, um, who, sorry, I would like to thank to the health professionals and general population who are involved in this project. Thank you for your attention. Excellent presentation, Concepcion. So thank you very much, all, all the five panelists. So we, we have closed the round of presentation and we will open briefly uh, the round of, of questions questions and answers. While we allow uh, questions coming from, from the chat, we, I, I'll remind you again that the vote is still open for the beautiful science and game changer. And I know we cannot vote for vaccines in this panel, but please scroll down because I think we've seen very interesting cases both in, in the part of epidemiological studies. So, really understanding uh, what is the antibody response and, and the impact of mental health of, of the pandemic. And in the part of um, biosensors, how to make really diagnostic tools available for, for um, the populations in need of them. No? Um, so while you are voting and preparing your questions, I'm going to throw a, a first question to, to the panel. And um, it's a bit of, uh, also on, on our own interest so from, from me. Health. What, what we've seen in, in this pandemic is, is that um, this translation from science to innovation and to the community has accelerated uh, immensely. No? We, we've seen thousands of publications per week, um, hundreds of webinars, and, and, and so on. In uh, the EIT Health, we had to launch a, a call for COVID actions, uh, combining rapid response projects and, and, and to rescue also startups in, 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 in the middle of, of um, uh, raising funds of 40 million euros in just six weeks. And, and we've seen that, that all this um, science ecosystem has accelerated, but apart from speed, I wanted to ask you, and maybe you, you, it's open to all of you, um, what has changed, and not only just the topic of, of your research, Search in the way you develop and you do your your science since the COVID outbreak. Uh, certainly, it has changed the mo. Uh, I mean, the the teleworking has allowed uh, collaboration with many many uh, different uh, colleagues in many different areas. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to mention that I, I think it's a, uh, we are a little bit rushed and probably the rush is totally a, uh, is, is a challenge for uh, the, the paradigm that we were doing science. I, I'm not saying we should not be very quick, but I think it's, it's a challenging uh, situation. From, from my side, my, my opinion, I mean, I think that we are with this pandemic in particular working in the in the development of biosensors for diagnostics or monitoring i think we are all more conscious of why we are here and uh, and of what we have to do and of what we do but um, what what we do i mean we all do in this in this the people uh, attending to this to this seminar i mean these things can save life and should save life. It's a big motivation from my side, but and and these uh, allow us not to get lost in uh, you know science for love of science. But at the same time, it's it's a kind of tremendous responsibility. So uh, if we have to talk about how we feel or what changed, it changed that we are focused more to come out with something that works rather than publishing in, in nature then if we can do both better but now i mean i at least from my side 
I think we are more conscious of the importance of what we are doing. Yeah, I would like to remark what uh, Jordi said that uh, regarding the collaborations. So from our experience before, uh, fostering collaboration was kind of difficult. Uh, it had to go contact to contact. And now with all these webinars, uh, I mean, in our project, we have started like a lot of collaboration with uh, not only in, in Catalonia, but in Spain and even Europe. We have been uh, applying for multiple projects. And, uh, and those collaborations are kind collaborations. I mean, uh, nobody is uh, asking for reward, but uh, just uh, helping to develop uh, faster and uh, validating faster the devices so we can really push the innovation uh, towards the end, right? Yes, the Thank common you. purpose. <laughs> the yes, common so purpose. So we've seen that that I mean the the is not only the speed but it's also the purpose of of the science that is is making a lot of change in in the way we do uh, our work. Um, I've seen there are no questions from the audience, and as we are a bit uh, uh, behind the schedule, I'm going to give back the the floor to Jordi. So one of the things we've seen in this panel is is that it is not only about science; it's about translating this. Um, whether medtech uh, results and, and epidemiological studies to really um, uh, to the market or to the public health policy. And, and I think it is an important step that we need to do in order really, as, as Julie was saying, to save lives, which is in the end the, the purpose of all this um, speed action around uh, COVID research. So thank you all uh, in the panel, excellent discussion. And just let's give the, the floor to, to Jordina. Thank you, Christina. Thank you.